I'm Jonathan Mosin and this is Mosin at Large, the show that's got the blind community talking. This week, ACB says no to spelling Braille with a capital B, and I talk with audio engineer, musician, composer and lyricist Slau Hallerton about his new Pro Tools tutorial and so much more. Mosin at Large Podcast. Welcome to episode 188. If this is the first time that you've checked out the podcast, a special welcome to you. And if you've been traveling for the United States Blindness Conventions, I hope all of that went well. And I hope that you managed to get through unscathed, in other words, without getting coronavirus. It seems like there's quite a bit of it about. Not really surprising, given that this current variant is still highly virulent. And if you did come down with coronavirus, I hope it wasn't too serious and that you're making a full recovery. You may have some feedback on what you thought of the conventions. If you want to get in touch, by all means do that. Jonathan at mushroomfm.com is my email address. You can attach an audio clip to the email or you can just write it down in the good old fashioned way. If you prefer to phone your contribution in, that number in the United States is 864-60-MOSIN, 864-606-6736. The one thing I did want to comment on is, not surprisingly, Braille with an uppercase B and the resolution that went to the American Council of the Blinds Convention, Paul Edwards and I talked about this on the show a few weeks back, and that resolution did not pass. Now, I've already heard from a couple of people who are a bit grumpy about this, and I'd like to offer an alternative perspective. I think it is important to respect the democratic process, and those who don't agree with the decision can come back and fight another day. I actually think that eventually a resolution of this kind will pass, because the momentum is on the blind pride side. And that will only build up over time, I think. So you've got to focus on the bigger picture. But one of the criticisms that I heard from some people was the Braille resolution was not debated before the full convention. It didn't get an airing until a Zoom meeting where they did a kind of a mop up because they couldn't get through all the business, including several resolutions that needed to be conducted at the convention. And the argument that was advanced was it was so close at that meeting that it may have gone the other way had it been debated at the full convention. Now, two things. My understanding is that the reason why it wasn't debated at the full convention was that it was the only resolution where the resolutions committee didn't make a recommendation and that required a slightly different process. Not a radically different process, I have to say, but a slightly different one. Therefore, the president who has discretion to do these things decided to take it out of the sequential order and put it at the end of business. And it is true that the resolution was fairly narrowly defeated in that debate. However, I think that even if it had gone the other way, and it may have, it may have gone the other way if it was debated at the full convention with people in attendance, it still would have ended up going where it went. After a voice vote, if 25 people or more stand and call for a roll call vote where the states and the affiliates get votes proportionate to their size, then that can happen. And that did happen. And it went to another Zoom meeting for that vote where it also lost. So focus on the future and maybe doing the resolution again or a different way rather than being churlish about the outcome because the outcome was the democratic process at work. Being a sore loser isn't cool. You might get called Trumpian and you wouldn't want to be called Trumpian now, would you? So while I'm not calling the process into question at all, I would like to pick up on one point that was made during the debates that I heard. And I discuss this because it has not come up on this podcast before, and it didn't come up when Paul Edwards and I were having our debate a few weeks ago. It was said by a couple of people who were speaking against the resolution that one of the reasons why they were against it is that blind kids have been taught for years to spell Braille with a lowercase b unless it is specifically referring to Louis Braille the man, and therefore they would have to relearn how to spell Braille, and that would be terrible. Well, I say two things to that. We can't be locked in a time warp. Things move on all the time. Sometimes words are capitalized for all kinds of reasons. There may be cultural changes, any number of things. If we say that we can't make this change because kids learned it another way in school, we would never make progress as a society. So I think that's a rather fallacious argument. But the second reason why I'm concerned about it is that it rewards appalling behavior. There was no widespread consultation with the blind community 
when it was determined to issue a recommendation to stop spelling Braille with an uppercase B when referring to the code. So even though it was not a democratic process, that many people feel pretty miffed that they weren't consulted about something so consequential, the argument that these people advanced is, well, we've done it all this time now, so we'd better not change. The change should never have happened without appropriate consultation in the first place. So it really is enabling and rewarding bad behavior. Anyway, I'm sure that the proponents in ACB of capitalizing Braille when referring to the code will be back. As someone who has an interest in this topic, I was interested in when the resolution was going to be debated. I was interested in when the roll call vote was taking place. And one of the things that really struck me this year was how off its game ACB was in terms of social media. There was very little official tweeting by ACB about when general sessions were starting, where you could go to listen to them, a little bit about resolutions passing, nothing, nothing at all. It was the convention was hardly taking place. There were one or two tweets, but nothing that actually directed people to tune in at given times or anything like that. It was really bizarre. And after the convention officially finished, There was zero. There was no warning to tune in at, I think it was 11 a.m. Central Time on the Monday for that extra session. Nobody tweeted how each resolution went. It was really odd. So I'm not sure what's up with ACB and social media, but I think they really did drop the ball this year. Mosin at Large Podcast. Rod Khan says, Hi Jonathan, since installing iOS 15.5, text selection on the rotor doesn't work anymore for me. Is it me or iOS 15.5? Rod, I'm running the beta on my primary device of iOS 15.6 at the moment, and I did a quick check of text selection on the rotor, and all is okay. Yeah, knocking on the wood. So I don't have a 15.5 device to test with, but if anybody else can report whether text selection is working okay for you in 15.5, do let us know. Gene is back and says, I lost my vision to glaucoma when I was in my mid-50s, and with all the technology available, I decided to forego learning Braille. Notice that the B is capitalized. Yet I found that bit of history about the origins of Braille very interesting. I have also had problems with people thinking that because I am blind, that I must be crippled or incapable. A couple of weeks ago, I was being brought home by a Lyft or Uber driver. The local paratransit service outsources the actual transportation to either of these ride-sharing services. Instead of dropping me off in front of my apartment door, as he was supposed to, he dropped me off in the street in front of the apartment community. Then, to make matters worse, didn't bother to tell me where he was dropping me off. Needless to say, I became disoriented with no idea where I actually was. I was beginning to feel panicky about getting home. I called Ira to help me get orientated so I could find my apartment and was beginning to walk home and I was approached by three or four good Samaritans offering to help me get home. I tried to tell them that I was already being helped and to thank them for their offers, but they wouldn't hear of it and insisted that I needed their help and proceeded to guide, more like push, me home. I found the whole experience to be very upsetting. Yes, it is. It's upsetting, it's demeaning, it's degrading, it's humiliating, and uh, sometimes you do get in this sort of situation. Isn't it ironic, though, that you can try and work things out And then you decide, look, it's just easier if I call Ira. And then the moment you call Ira and people see that you're talking to your phone and holding out your phone's camera and whatever, for some reason that seems to trigger people. I can't tell you the number of times that when I've used Ira, people have suddenly decided that they need to intervene. It's extraordinary. Gene says, I didn't mean to be quite so harsh in my comments about the We Walk cane. I'm sure there are people who simply love it. But in my own defense, I was unhappy because when I tried to return it, they refused, saying that the 14-day return window had expired. I hadn't known that their return window was so short. I thought I had 30 days to return it, which is the standard. 
I can only guess that somebody had taken them to task on the short return window since you mentioned that it is now the standard 30 days. I don't think I did mention that. I don't think I've mentioned any right of return with WeWalk. I kind of wish I had returned it when I had the chance because I'm just not using it and I don't think I ever will. Thanks for the tip about Walter, says Jean, but it sounds like it only pushes content to the phone. Considering that I apparently cannot access my photos on my iCloud drive with my Windows PC without sighted assistance, I would also need a way to transfer my photos off the phone. The only way I've been able to do it so far was to email them to myself. It works, but it's not very convenient. Gene, you may be able to get initial sighted assistance to configure iCloud Drive. It is not the most screen reader friendly experience. This is Apple's little hidden secret that when you look at some of their Windows applications, be they iTunes or iCloud Drive, they are not the best. But once you get iCloud Drive configured, it just sits there and it runs in the background. And you will then be able to browse your photos in File Explorer and it will appear as another folder. So it is worth doing. And since you mentioned Ira, this is something you can use with them. You can get TeamViewer, have Ira TeamViewer into your computer with you and just do that initial iCloud configuration. Once it's done, it'll just keep working. Gene says, there turned out to be so many episodes, this is of Mosin at Large, I wanted to listen to from just the titles. I decided not to bother with looking at the transcripts and also decided to stop going back in time when I got to the beginning of the holiday season in 2021. So I only went back about six to eight months, but I enjoyed all of the episodes that I did listen to and am looking forward to what you come up with from here on. Oh, no pressure. I hope all is well down there in Mosinland, and that you and your family are keeping warm while I hibernate in the air conditioning while Florida roasts in the heat of summer. Ah, our turn will come, Jean. Our turn will come. Dean Charlton writes, I'd like to share with you and all the listeners something that happened to me regarding my Amazon Echoes, as I would be interested to hear how many others this has happened to. This is my first time. I brought a second pair of third generation Echoes to go with my other two third generation Echoes. They were at reduced price, no less. Everything went fine with setting the new pair up and having that stereo pair in my bedroom and the first set in my living area with my second generation taking up its new home on top of my washing machine in between the stereo pairs. Things were fine for two days. Then I would start an album to play everywhere, playing on the echoes in the bedroom. When I came out to the living area, they weren't playing at all. I told one echo to stop, and I said that three more times, the same result. Then the second echo, she stopped the music. I then got her to restart the same pair and it still wouldn't play. I then took a look at the one that wouldn't play and there was a yellow light spinning round. I thought it was a notification, so I asked for the notification and still no answer from her. Then I asked the one that was working and she said you have no notifications. I would then press the reset button on the echo with the yellow light. She said updating device. I hadn't heard that before. I then plugged her back in after five minutes or so and still the same outcome. I then jumped on YouTube and was told that there was nothing to worry about. This can take up to two hours before it will come right. Worst case scenario, eight to 12 hours. That YouTuber said he ended up resetting his device. So I then did the reset thing. Everything was normal on the app while doing this. She burst back to life, but it was short-lived. The yellow light was back. The next morning, hello, still the unwelcome yellow light. I would go as far as resetting all five of my echoes. That didn't work. I even unplugged the Wi-Fi, and that didn't work. One whole week later, I would enlist my computer technician on the case. He also hadn't come across this before. He firstly changed the Wi-Fi to his phone. That still didn't work. Then he jumped on my computer and found other people on Reddit with this problem also. The eventual conclusion would be doing a factory reset. I would give myself an uppercut for not thinking of this because that's what brought it back to life. 
just like she would be when you get her out of the box. So I was somewhat very relieved with this eventual outcome. Now I have glorious stereo music and podcast everywhere in my little unit. Thanks, Dean. You would be amazed at how many people I have made happy by telling them to turn things off and back on again and factory reset things if necessary. (laughs) So these things are computers, of course. They're mini computers. And sometimes things just go wrong inexplicably. And so when things like that happen, it's always good to try a full factory reset. So it behaves as if you had just got it from the store and see if that does the job. So that could be something that saves someone else a lot of time. So thanks for passing it on. And I hope that it all goes smoothly from here on in. Be the first to know what's coming in the next episode of Mosin at Large. Opt in to the Mosin media list and receive a brief email on what's coming so you can get your contribution in ahead of the show. You can stop receiving emails anytime. To join, send a blank email to media-subscribe at mosin.org. That's media-subscribe at M-O-S-E-N dot org. Stay in the know with Mosin at Large. Hi to everybody, says Andy. I'm wondering if there may be others among us that use the Otacon S1 hearing aids and also play an acoustic guitar. The problem I'm having is that I have my everyday default hearing program set up just the way I like it which includes when listening to live music remotely, i.e. live music or music through speakers. However, when I am playing my acoustic guitar, it is so close to me because I'm hugging it, my hearing aids by default start to make adjustments and give me back what it thinks I'm losing because of the close proximity of the lower strong frequencies, which override the high frequencies, which is where my hearing loss exists. The result of this is that the guitar loses its gorgeous, warm, resonant tones and finishes up sounding quiet and muddy to my ears. It's okay to begin with. When I strum a couple of chords, it sounds lovely. But then the hearing aid automatic adjustments start to try and work out what it thinks it should be doing. And the quality is lost. As you can imagine, I've had many conversations with my audiologist about how we may be able to get over this with this particular brand of hearing aid. And I do have to say, the service I get from him is excellent. Unfortunately, it seems while there are many benefits to how Otacon delivers audio, there isn't a way to simply just lift up the frequencies that are being reset by the hearing aids when they detect a volume of music close up. My audiologist tells me that the issue is not one of frequency equalization, like in the good old days of graphical equalizers. It is more an issue of the feedback manager in the hearing aids trying to pull back on frequency clipping. That's about as much as I know and understand of the problem. What I'm hoping for is some ideas and a solution. I can have as many as five different soundscape programs with these hearing aids, But because my default program sounds so good and natural in all environments, I rarely need or use alternative environmental settings. So all I really want in a nutshell is to be able to play my guitar without hearing aids making frequency adjustments, presumably because it assumes I'm in conversation and there is too much noise nearby and it needs to be toned down. Thanks, Jonathan, for this platform where we can air and share our challenges and to all who support it. Thank you very much. That is Andy Collins writing in from Devon in the United Kingdom. I don't play guitar, Andy, but I do play keyboards. And I sit at my Yamaha full-length piano thingy, which does all sorts of other magic things. It's amazing these days that you can get these keyboards that have the weight and feel of playing a full acoustic piano, but they're not acoustic and they do all sorts of other things. And I play it for pleasure these days and things. And I cannot use my default hearing aid program for that, precisely for the reason you mentioned. You're so close to the instrument and you're playing it that it's not going to work out. And I don't think there's a way that it ever will. I have to say, when I'm sitting listening to music on our Sonos system in the living room, it's not good on the default program either. But that's really why hearing aids have multiple programs. So when I'm playing or when I'm listening to music, I switch to the music program. This makes sense, really, because what the hearing aid can't really tell is the context. So when you are in an environment, when you're trying to have a conversation with someone, 
it's probably a very valid thing to do to try and filter the music out a little bit so that the person you're speaking with comes through louder and clearer. But if music is the focal point of what you're doing, you don't want that. And that's precisely why you have another program. So I'm not sure that there's a way around your dilemma other than to have your audiologist set up the music program that's specifically intended for this purpose. And when you've got your axe there, man, you just switch to that music program and play it, and you should get a great experience. I find the Oticon aids sound great in a music environment if you use the music program. And similarly, if I go to a live concert, be it the orchestra or something else, I'll switch to the music program there as well. Otherwise, everything sounds kind of really mushy and compressed and compact. Christian Bertling writes, Hey, Jonathan, I have two questions relating to Microsoft 365. One, how do you open a link in a Microsoft Word document? I know that old Enter does it in Google Docs. Christian, you can just make sure that focus is on the link. In other words, you can use your arrow keys to navigate to the link and press enter. And as long as you press enter when the cursor or the carrot is on the link text somewhere, it will open up the link. You can also invoke your screen reader's list of links feature and invoke it from there. But I just press enter on the link and it goes ahead and opens it. Question two, I noticed in Outlook that when I went to the people section, It was not displaying my contacts I have backed up to Google Contacts. My Gmail account is the only account I have set up in Outlook. Do you know why it wouldn't be showing my Google Contacts? I don't, Christian. I'm decidedly not a Gmail fan, and so I have never tried to do this myself. If anybody has any tips, because Gmail is in very common usage on how you sync your Gmail contacts and your Outlook contacts, then please go ahead and uh, chime in. 864-60-MOSIN. If you want to give me a call, you can also email with an audio attachment or write something down, jonathan at mushroomfm.com. And Christian, if you're in a hurry, you may like to avail yourself of the services of Microsoft's free disability answer desk. They are very good. Or Dr. Google could be your friend here. You can consult Google because this is really not an accessibility related thing. So there's bound to be heaps of information out there about getting Google and Outlook to play nice with each other. This week on the podcast, we're talking to a legend. Slough Hallerton is a composer, a lyricist, an advocate, one of the best damn audio engineers out there, and he has produced a series of tutorials on Pro Tools, so you can at least try and do what he does. This is the industry standard for audio production, and using these from a blind person's perspective. So I thought it would be great to get him on the podcast to talk about that, but also just to have a bit of a chat about stuff, really. So, so now it's really great to have you here. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. It's an honor to be here, and I'm very excited to speak with you. It's been it's been a long time. It has, because you used to do some stuff for Main Menu way back when we started that. Yes, yes. I mean, that's I, I think back now, uh, actually, I think I did something, uh, one of the things I did was when, when when Pro Tools first became accessible in OS X, this was something that we waited for, uh, for for several years. I did a little demonstration. That's got to be going on uh, something like 14 years ago. So did you get started with this whole audio gig like many of us with tape recorders and just messing about with that? What piqued your interest in audio? <laughs> Being a musician, I was always involved with music technology. I mean, stuff like amplifiers, PA systems, microphones, that kind of thing, ever since I was a teenager. And I think back to when I was, uh, even before teenage years, I had a a, a little reel-to-reel recorder. I mean, the, the the reel was probably, you know, like about three or four inches, you know, it was uh, in diameter. It was, yeah, one of these like tiny reel-to-reel recorders. And I was just mesmerized by it. And then my oldest brother at the time, uh, he, he had been in the Navy and I, I think he got some electronic training. He hooked up an external speaker through the auxiliary output of this tape machine. And I was just so amazed that this was possible and, and people can do this and solder cables and stuff like that. So I was always intrigued by all of this stuff. And then when I was in my late teens, I was hired to do some session work as a guitarist, and that involved going to recording studios and working on television jingles, film soundtracks, and that sort of thing. I was just playing guitar for these things, but being in that environment, 
I was so enthralled by just the whole process and how things worked. And eventually, when I was in college, the first time I went, I was in for industrial design, something very visually oriented. I I was sighted until I was uh, in my late teens. And even at that point, I have retinitis pigmentosa. So I wasn't even aware that I had any visual impairment until I would start like missing things and walking into parking meters and and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. I would back off and look directly at it and go, how could I miss that? Um, Well, anyway, so when I was in college the first time, it was for something very visually oriented. And then I lost a lot of vision over the course of just a few years. I mean, to the point where I still had partial sight, but like for purposes of drawing and sketching and stuff like that, I I just couldn't do the work that was required for industrial design. And so I went back to school for a music degree. And at the time, I looked for schools that had a strong audio program. And so I eventually found Five Towns College out on Long Island here in New York. And to me, it was like the best of both worlds. I, I, I w- was able to study music formally, which prior to that, I, I had lessons, individual lessons, you know, piano lessons and that that sort of thing. But this was a proper music degree with a concentration in audio recording technology. So yeah, the whole thing was based around analog tape, big, large format consoles, and uh, I just loved it. I'm a major Beatles collector, and I often use parallels with Beatles things that went on. You have John and Paul down there playing their instruments and working their incredible magic, and up there you've got George Martin in the control booth, kind of like God. And eventually... The Beatles pick up a few things and and they start thinking, well, I can produce some of this stuff. And they did. They got into a bit of production things and playing with the knobs and things like that. And then you've got the reverse. You've got Alan Parsons, who was also a part of that crowd later in the Beatles' career. And he was an engineer. And, of course, later he formed the Alan Parsons Project. So some people Mm -hmm. start from either direction. But it sounds like you were always on parallel with both at the same time. Yes, I I was. And I loved both equally. And to this day, if I'm recording something, one of the things that clients of mine in, in my studio, I think one of the things that they appreciate is that I am a musician first and foremost. And so while I am engineering stuff for them and recording stuff, I'm also giving them feedback if they need in terms of music. I mean, and so often engineers uh, will often tell stories of, you know, a band is playing and then, you know, the engineer stops them and say, wait a second, guitar, what are you playing? What chord? And he'll say A minor. And then keyboard, what are you playing? And say A major, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just things like that you find so often because these these bands, you know, they, they don't necessarily listen to each other very often. I'm talking about, obviously, lesser experienced acts and stuff like that. But when you're sitting there in front of okay a console or whatever and you know you're listening you can hear everything very clearly through the monitors so often you hear things that the musicians just don't notice and being a fresh pair of ears of course is great if you are a musician because you can offer constructive criticism if it's called for you know sometimes i don't want to call it an art but you sort of have to know when to chime in and when not to, you know, so there's a little bit of a a technique to that too, you know. Mm. When I worked in Mm. radio commercially, the person I always had trouble with when I was moving to a new radio station was the ops guy. And in those days, it was always a guy. And the Mm -hmm. ops guy would say, you may have worked at such and such a radio station, but there's no way that a blind person can work our gear. And you'd have to kind of win them over all over again. It was like your career was starting from scratch for them. And then eventually what would happen, though, is if they were making minor tweaks to the processing, for example, they would want me on the year working the board because I was listening and not looking at the meters and I was giving them feedback. So where I'm going with this is, have you been able to market your blindness actually as an advantage in that sense? I never consciously bring it up on purpose or refer to it or rely on it in any way. If anything, I just, to me, it's a non-issue. However, I find that no matter what, even if I don't 
it, it's not that I pretend that I'm not blind. It's not that. But even if nothing is said about being blind, when my clients, especially you know new clients, see me working and they, of course, in- inevitably hear the screen reader working at some point if they're in the control room and we're listening back, they are just inevitably so like mesmerized by the <laughs> the process and they, and of course everybody knows you know I, you know how people say i don't know how you understand that like you know because the screen reader is reading very quickly is that thing speaking or, english yes that kind of thing exactly but also you know i have a music production desk that's like seven feet wide and it's got a whole bunch of rack gear on the top left top right bottom left bottom right i mean it looks like a big old analog console uh, plus i have a big you know control Control surface in front of me and stuff. And there are hundreds and hundreds of buttons and switches, not to mention the software, which contains probably many times more than that. And people are just, they just don't understand how, you know, how I do it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I say to them, really, it's, it probably seems like an impossible thing for me to navigate or do. But I, you know, I explain to them a mixer strip in, in a console and how it's essentially replicated from left to right channels on an interface. I have several microphone preamps. They're all the same. It's just one set of controls and then multiplied by eight or by 16, et cetera, et cetera. So I think people are just fascinated. And I have gotten involved in some software development related to Pro Tools and stuff like that. And and <laughs> sort of some of my clients, because of this, they will talk to other clients and say, yeah, he, he designed this studio, which, which I did essentially because of my industrial design background. I specify things even in the building and acoustic treatment and stuff like that. But they will say things like, well, he designed the studio and it talks to him, (laughs) you know, (laughs) so, you know, it's just people don't have that much experience with a blind recording engineer. And again, I don't make anything of it. It really never comes up unless we're sitting there doing something and just every once in a while someone will say, God, like, I can't believe how fast you did that. And, you know, and I'll, you know, I'll sometimes explain. Sometimes I'll just say, uh, well, I try my best. You know, I just don't even want to get into it. I want to do a deep dive into Pro Tools, of course. But before we go there, you also were at the forefront of the podcast movement. And I can remember doing my first podcast in, I think it was October of 2004. And I put Mm. this email out saying we're going to try this new thing called podcasting. And I remember somebody wrote back and said, what is a podcast? And I said, hey, I'm not inhaling here. You know, it was a podcast, man. (laughs) Um, But they they were magical times, weren't they? A whole bunch of pioneers, you know, and you really had to go under the hood. There weren't these services and publishing tools that we have. Sometimes you'd have to manually play with the RSS feed. But it was a very cool time to be a part of that small group doing that stuff. It certainly was, and it really was kind of like the Wild West uh, a bit. And yes, the, the the community was very small. I remember going to a couple of these portable media expos, or you know, sometimes they would be called podcast expo, but they they were officially known as portable media expos out in California. I'm trying to think of the city. Oh, Ontario, California was the the city close to Anaheim, I suppose. And it was just really. It's so amazing to be in this. I mean, there was there was a an exhibition hall, so a lot of exhibitors surrounding sort of the world of podcasting. I mean, Lipson was there, Blueberry equipment manufacturers, maybe Roland, uh, you know, the Ederol Record. I mean, all these Tascam, a, a bunch of manufacturers were showing their wares there. And then afterwards, you'd you'd have essentially parties throughout the hotel where the expo was taking place, performances and stuff. And and you'd get to meet these people that, for all intents and purposes, they were, you know, radio DJs. I mean, that's that's how people looked at it in a way. But it was sort of like underground. It was exciting because you could interact with these podcasters. I got into it for a while. Unfortunately, my show, Sessions with Slough, faded after, I don't know, 30 episodes or something like that. And I always threaten to revive it. And maybe I will. (laughs) But it was wonderful. Yes, it was very exciting. It was very exciting. And it's just incredible. You were saying 2004. I mean, yeah. I mean, some of my friends have been 
consistently podcasting since 2004. I mean, that's just crazy to think of. Yeah. Yes. I don't think, uh, maybe, no, I don't think there's a period since then that I haven't been doing a podcast or another. So there have been various podcasts, but I think I've been continuously podcasting since then. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's an ideal medium for blind people to be a part of, both at the creation and the consumption end. It is. Yes, absolutely. I don't know sort of statistically or what the numbers are, but I know that especially early on, the blind community really did embrace it quite mm. a bit because it was audio in nature and stuff. It was a lot of it was music based, but it wasn't necessarily. I mean, it was just anything. It was just really it was storytelling. And who doesn't like a good story? Yeah, the big thing that uh, it was a term that I believe Adam Curry pioneered as he did a number of terms in podcasting was the sound seeing tour. And there was a lot of yeah. blind people were walking around with binaural microphones and Edural R1s or Edural R9s and just sort of recording what happened. And of course, uh, the, yes. the, the grandfather of all of that was Larry Scootcon, who would Larry do Scootcon, you know, yes. two or three yeah. episodes of Blind Cool Tech a day at one point. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, it was just wonderful. You basically listening to his podcast, you, you basically felt like you were walking alongside him or in his head, whichever way you want to <laughs> perceive yeah. it. But, but, you know, sitting on his shoulders, I don't know, accompanying him on this walk and just and listening. And it was wonderful. I mean, I think in the podcasting world, you know, anybody who has done a regular podcast knows that when you do a regularly scheduled podcast and you skip a week, uh. depending on how many listeners you have, you know, you'll get dozens of emails saying, is everything OK? Is everything, you know, you know like the people really, they kind of get hooked. Some podcasters referred to their listeners as junkies, like because if they didn't have one episode one week, uh, I remember Scott Sigler, you know, he would call his uh, readers, his listeners, you know, junkies you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. in the best possible way. They were addicted to this stuff. And I mean, when you consider the amount of choice that's out there, it is quite humbling when you have many thousands of listeners who bother to choose the little thing that you're offering, you know? I mean, it's it, sure. it really is a very special thing. But your Absolutely. big contribution, I think, that still is talked about is the work that you did with a conglomerate of podcasters called Pod Safe for Peace. And you wrote that song, right, If Every Day Were Christmas, as well as produced. It was sort of like a We Are The World thing. And when I listen to that, yes. I think, man, that must have been tricky because you've got a lot of people with a bunch of mics. And I don't know how many you had to auto-tune or whatever, but that must have been one <laughs> hell of a project. It was. And I have to say that I was considered a co-writer of that song. So the first version of it was written by a friend of mine. His name is Orlando Pagan. He's a dancer, danced with the Dance Theater of Harlem. He's been with the Sizukrili Ukrainian dance group uh, for you know decades. And he's Puerto Rican. He's ethnically Puerto Rican, but he just is so in the Ukrainian community here in New York that you know, that's how I got to know him was through, through the Ukrainian community, oddly. So Orlando came to me with this song and he said, I'd like to record some kind of a demo, but the, the bridge, I don't know about, like maybe we could, you know, could you give me some ideas or think about it and stuff? So I recorded him just playing it on guitar and uh, he left it with me. I came up with the bridge and then I recorded a basic demo of it and I sang it and just did a respectable sort of like demo recording of it. And one evening, this is around Halloween, 2005, I guess. I, yeah. I, I don't even remember. I think so. It was either 2005 or 2006. I was listening to uh, Daily Source Code and the big thing back then was being able to play commercial music without needing a performing rights organization license to not be essentially breaking the law. What they'd call pod safe artists, you know, would contribute, would, would upload their songs and uh, essentially give the right to podcasters, anyone who belonged to this network, the right to play these songs without worrying that ASCAP was going to complain or BMI was going to complain. And so uh, he said, yeah, we don't have any Christmas songs, you know, and, you know, Christmas season is upon us. And like right away, I thought, oh, my gosh, I have a song that, you know, there's Orlando's tune that 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 we sort of co-wrote. I asked Orlando if I could post it. And he said, sure, you know, why not? And I posted it that night. And literally the very next day, Adam Curry played it on the Daily Source Code. And at the end of the song, he was like, 
wow. He says, I love this song. And, you know, it sounds to me like an anthem. What if we, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where he, you know, was saying this idea about getting a bunch of podcasters or musicians that were in the Podsafe Music Network uh, to get them together and produce some kind of song, you know, some to, to uh, perform this song. And, of course, he said, you know, it could be a benefit and stuff like that. And so I said, yeah, let's do it. And, I mean, logistically, there was a big challenge, yes. We took submissions from people that were mostly singing. So it wasn't too challenging in that sense. The music was largely done here at my studio uh, in New York. And uh, there was a sax player who contributed, uh, so he recorded himself playing sax. I'm trying to think if there were any other instrumentalists. I think everything else was vocal based. Some of the vocalists were here in New York. So I've recorded like Brother Love, the Lascivious Biddies, a bunch of other uh, singers here. But, you know, people were submitting stuff from the Netherlands, from Australia, from England, from France, uh, Germany. I mean, just, you know, all over the place. A lot of Canadian artists. And yeah, they sent all their stuff in and I had a lot of stuff to edit I had to decide which singers would sing which line because uh, I decided, well, let's just divide everything up. But the thing is, you don't know how somebody's going to really do on a given line. So I asked everybody to just sing the entire song and then I would pick and choose later. Well, you know, (laughs) I mean, it's like dozens and dozens and dozens of lines. And what was it? 50 singers. So it was an extraordinary amount of work, a tremendous amount of work. But I was very happy in the end with the result. And I made a ton of friends and ton of acquaintances. And I sort of like, yes, made my mark in in that sort of podcasting world. And people, I, I'd go to these you know, portable media expo things or AES conventions or NAM shows. And people would say, oh, yeah, you're with the pot safe. Th- th-. <laughs> like they would know him. maybe they might not remember the name, or, but they would remember the song and they would know about me and stuff. So it was uh, it was quite rewarding in that sense. And you re-recorded it yourself some years later. And I have to say that that is one of my most favorite Christmas songs. Every year on Mushroom FM, we have a top 100 countdown. And we give people a web page and they vote for their top 10 songs. And usually this song does chart somewhere on the countdown. It is is one of my favorite songs. Well, thank you so much. I'm so delighted to hear that. And I have to say that eventually Orlando did a couple of years after the uh, the Podsay for Peace version. He did approach me and say, hey, listen, would you be willing to, you know, record it as just like as an artist, you know, just by yourself? You know, I'd love to be able to have it up on iTunes and stuff like that. And I said, sure. I said, but would it be okay if I revisited the lyrics? There were certain things about it that. I felt could be improved. And these were not major changes. They were small changes. And he said, absolutely, do whatever you want. I, you know, he trusted my sensibilities. And so I did rewrite some of the things so that couplets actually were real rhymes, uh, true rhymes, rather than sort of pseudo rhymes and stuff like that. And uh, he was very happy in the end. And, and I was, you know, happy to do it. And so, yes, I, I did re-record it. And, and, it, and it's sort of closer to the original intent of the song. I, th- I think that with the whole Pod Save for Peace version, it had to be grand, you know, and so I, it, we did it in that sort of almost gospelish style. But that's not how Orlando envisioned the song originally. And I understood that. And I understood why he wanted to have sort of like the version that he originally envisioned. And I was very happy to do that. First winter snow outside my window like that time again to me from mistletoe a Christmas
Christmas show and the lighting of that famous Christmas tree. People are thinking of their loved ones as signs of holidays appear. But it all goes by in the blink of an eye, and then we have to wait another year. But what if? Christmas. What a wonderful world this would be. We would never feel blue. We'd make all our dreams come true if Christmas were every day. It's a, a great track. Let's talk Pro Tools. I can remember that there was a period where Pro Tools really wasn't listening and you were at the forefront of trying to make them listen, right? Well, yeah. The thing is, in the mid-90s, Pro Tools and the screen reader at the time, which was called Outspoken, it was made by Berkeley Systems. Uh, it worked under OS 9, uh, Apple's, uh, you know, Macintosh OS 9 operating system. Pro Tools was pretty accessible in that environment. There was a problem with the uh, speech engine and Pro Tools and like it would, Pro Tools would crash because of the screen reader and stuff for a while. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Rick Boggs at one of the NAM shows, you know, came up to DigiDesign and asked them if they would be able to work with Alva Access Group at that point. Berkeley Systems became Alva Access Group. If they would work together and solve this problem and they didn't seem to express too much interest. And he said, oh, well, it's okay. You know, the the, the, the logic people will, uh, you know, they, they expressed an interest. And they said, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, 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 what's <laughs> going on? You know, so, <laughs> so there was this little bit of a competition there. And uh, so Pro Tools was pretty accessible under OS 9. And that's when I was really introduced to it. When I was in school at Five Towns, uh, we were taught certain things on Pro Tools. Pro Tools was, was pretty new at the time and studios weren't really using it too much. But in school, they were teaching it because they, they realized that, of course, this is the future. So there were a number of blind Mac users using Pro Tools. Then OS X was developed. And unfortunately, uh, the screen reader was not going to be available. They didn't want to allow a third party to be that close to the system's kernel, basically. And so Apple said, we're developing our own screen reader. And we thought, okay, all right, well, it'd be better to have access to the system rather than not. So everybody was waiting with great anticipation. And I did get on the Apple beta before voiceover was called that. It was it was called spoken interface. And I do remember being very excited to be able to finally use OS X accessibly. The problem was when I launched Pro Tools, it saw nothing. The screen reader saw absolutely nothing. And this was, you know, to me, a big emergency. And OS 9 users using Outspoken, we contacted DigiDesign and inquired with them about doing this. And I think it was much like the time at NAM when Rick just spoke with them. They didn't seem to be terribly interested in it. At a certain point, we decided, you know what, we're going to create a petition. And so I wrote this petition, and I think it got something like twelve or 1,500 signatures. And I printed a number of these out, bound them, and was going to FedEx them to the corporate headquarters. And clearly somebody at, it was DigiDesign at the time, Avid is a company that dealt with a lot of video production and they essentially bought DigiDesign, the makers of Pro Tools. So I, I say Avid and DigiDesign interchangeably right now. So sorry for if there's confusion here, but DigiDesign did get wind of this petition and I got a call from them asking, hey, are you going to be out at the NAM show? Can we set up a meeting here at DigiDesign uh, so that we can sort of take a look at you know, how you use 
Pro Tools under OS 9 and what the difference is under OS 10. And it was the best possible scenario because I brought my laptop with OS 9 running on an iBook and uh, they had a little interface there and stuff. And I set it up and right next to it is their OS 10 system. And I showed them how I use Pro Tools and how the screen reader reads information and how I can navigate and, and using keyboard shortcuts. I don't even have to touch the mouse, et cetera, et cetera. And then... I sit down in front of the OS 10 machine and nothing. I mean, I could get into the menu bar. That was it. And if I brought up some kind of a dialogue, like a setup dialogue, it would say dialogue and that's it. Nothing else inside of it. And so it was a great illustration of the need. And the VP of marketing at the at the time, David Gibbons, said, wow, you know, we've clearly broken something in this transition and, you know, we need to uh, because, other you know, other things in OS 10 were accessible. If the developer followed Apple's guidelines for accessibility, things were accessible. It's just Pro Tools wasn't. And so they promised that they would essentially after a particular transition of some screen drawing widgets or whatever they were working on at the time, they promised they would address this. Now, our meeting was in 2006, October, and I believe the release of the first accessible version was two years later in 2008. So it was a long time to wait, but I knew that... Well, at least I got the sense that they were going to be true to their word. At least David was. And indeed, for our second in-person meeting in 2008, uh, he assembled a team of people and sort of went over the importance of this and, and showed us the results of the work of a particular intern who worked at Avid uh, that summer. And uh, it it was extraordinary. I mean, it was really quite literally was like somebody turned the lights on because I could sit down in front of Pro Tools and navigate everything and see, well, you know, at that point, it was 90% of the interface and things were accessible. It was extraordinary. And there started the journey that continues to today because there are always new features, new things to address. And some years later, when they were making a transition to 64-bit architecture, et cetera, et cetera, you know, some things started to break. And this led to me reaching out to the CEO at the time and asking whether Avid would consider voiceover like another language, because the vice president uh, in charge of Pro Tools at the time, Rich Holmes, suggested that the only way we could really justify putting in the work at this point, because it's like constant work, is to consider voiceover like international language support. So if there's a problem with the French version or the Italian version of Pro Tools, you know, with the language support, we fix it. So I wrote to the CEO and he absolutely supported it and said, yes, absolutely, whatever it takes, you're working with the right people, continue this work and let's make it official. And um, to this day, it it still continues. Right now, we have uh, the great Mr. Ed Gray, who is blind himself, who has been an avid employee for about 30 years. And he sort of became the de facto person in charge of like accessibility. But he's also uh, like a director of third party partnering for avid. So plug in developers and that sort of thing and other software developers. So to have him as an ally at Avid is truly wonderful because he knows everybody and everybody knows him and everybody loves him. So we're in a good position. The challenge, of course, is that accessibility is never going to be as important as other stuff. I mean, that's just the reality here. But the fact that we have sort of a direct line to Avid in this case, and we have a number of blind users on the beta team, I think that is taken into consideration and sort of weighted in a certain sense when we submit a bug. Because for a sighted user, if if something is not working correctly, usually there are other ways to do things. But sometimes from an accessibility standpoint, if something isn't working, there is no other workaround. You know, so I think they do take that into consideration. 
so often breaking through that first line and getting that direct line is the key to not just digital advocacy, but advocacy of all kinds. And it only really takes one champion, doesn't it? Somebody with the influence to make a, an appreciable difference. When you yes. were waiting for that OS ten stuff to happen, does that mean that you had an OS nine system in your studio and were just hoping it didn't break? Yes, my studio was an analog based studio, so I had a a large format console, a tape machine, all that kind of stuff. I was analog based, and I was using a Mac, but not using Pro Tools full time or anything. It wasn't my primary workstation. At a certain point, though, I'd say it was around 2001, 2002, it was the end of 2001, I suppose, I decided to transition completely to Pro Tools as the workstation for the studio. So Spoken Interface did not come out until 2004. So there were just a couple of years where OS 9 and OS 10 were shipping at the same time. On the same machine, you would have both OS 9 and OS 10. So, you know, it didn't seem like such an emergency or anything like that. Although two years for me was like I was quite anxious, as were other uh, Pro Tools users. But by the time Pro Tools was truly accessible, now that's another four years, you know, after a spoken interface. So, yeah, I mean, I had a machine that I got in 2001 that was still working in 2009, 2010. I didn't make the transition to an OS X full-time machine in the studio until I'd say probably 2011. So it was a good 10 years of using the older operating system. I think back on it now and think, oh, wow, that was a little bit risky. It didn't feel like it at the time. Although I did feel toward the end of it, like, wow, there's so much that I could be doing in OS X. I hope everything's ready for prime time because making Pro Tools accessible, that was one thing. But trying it in the heat of battle, that's a different thing. Yeah. And you have to know the software and all of its quirks and the quirks of the screen reader with the software. You have to know it so well that you don't even think about what you're doing because time is money. So it, it did take me a couple of years to really feel f truly comfortable with that change. But once I made it, I was just so happy that I did. The nice thing is that now I don't hesitate about anything. You know, if I need to buy a new computer or something like that or upgrade to the latest Pro Tools, there's no concern. It's a known entity and uh, I feel very comfortable with it. I think this is a very important story, and I'm glad we've spent so much time on it, because sometimes people think that accessibility happens by magic. And a lot of the time, what people are doing if they come into something late when this work has been done is that they are benefiting from very hard efforts on the part of some blind people who have gone in there and not taken no for an answer and advocated constructively to get an outcome. I would encourage people to learn from that story and advocate constructively for the accessibility of the tools they need to use. Is it accessible in Windows as well? Or if you want to use Pro Tools, do you need to use a Mac? Currently, it's only accessible on the Mac. The Windows accessibility is something that Avid would like to do. It's a completely different animal. Historically, Avid has been, I mean, going back to the DigiDesign days, I'm not going to say Mac-centric, but they really do focus on their Mac development first and Windows second. Avid's biggest client base is undoubtedly the broadcast industry and the studio industry. The market share is like 90% Mac and like 10% Windows. Now, when you think about the sort of like the project studio or the home studio market, that these days is almost 50-50. So I think that they're devoting more resources toward the Windows development. And we've certainly, with Avid, have been in touch with some people from Microsoft who are on the accessibility team and who have expressed an interest in helping out. And there is some also some kind of partnership with Avid and Microsoft. I think it's on the server end of their cloud collaboration program and stuff like that. I think Microsoft is in the position 
to offer real assistance as far as programming and sort of helping make the Windows version accessible. But mind you, this is something that's been talked about for a couple of years. And of course, with the pandemic, I think that just threw the world off. So I'm sure it's something that has to be picked up again at some point. But for now, the accessibility of Pro Tools is really limited to the Mac platform. Mm, If I were just doing audio production in my life, I would be using a Mac exclusively in a heartbeat because the audio subsystems in the Mac are just so much more robust or or, latency is better, all kinds of things like that. Unfortunately, I don't. And I find that when I need to work with documents and collaborate with people and, and a whole bunch of stuff like that, Windows still has the edge. What's your assessment as a very long term Mac user? of the state of Mac accessibility, because some people have argued that with the advent of iOS, Mac has taken a bit of a back seat for Apple in terms of accessibility innovations. Well, I was a Windows user for about uh, a year or two, around the time that OS 9 was really not being developed anymore, and things were really moving to the internet in in a very fast way. I mean, this is the, the internet's been around for, for many years, of course, but sort of like, you know, day-to-day kind of things and requirements in the early 2000s, that was really becoming more and more important. And with OS 9 not being developed anymore, internet access was a sore point. And I started using Windows for a little while, but really... The extent of my experience with Windows was really only Windows XP. And I was very impressed with the accessibility of Windows as a Mac user. And when OS X became accessible, I was still using Windows for a little while. And then I realized if I didn't dive in full time, I was not going to learn it. I remember when you did your challenge, maybe it was with Marlena, where you d- decided to switch note takers or whatever. Oh, yeah. Like, weren't you using humanware? And she was, not, it was like you, you flipped and said, like, we're just going to use the competition's product, if you will, for lack of a better phrase. I just realized that if I didn't stop using Windows, I just wouldn't learn everything that I could about the Mac. And so that ended my Windows experience, really. Now, I know a lot of people who are both Mac and Windows users, and they can't see it any other way. They just say, look, you have to just use both because there are some things that a Mac is way better at, and there's some things that the Windows is just way better at. And I personally have not really gotten to the point where I feel that I need to revisit Windows. I mean, of course, I mean, I could run Windows on on a Mac if I needed to. And there are some people that get into the whole parallels thing and virtual machines. It's a bit hard to do Um, it on an M1 Mac now, though, you know, because it's ARM based and yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. That's true. So for me, I have not had the need. I mean, I don't work in a corporate environment. Everything that I have is quite contained within music production. And at least for me, all of the other stuff, like any kind of document reading and processing and, and that stuff, I find that the Mac for me works absolutely fine. And I don't see any need personally to use Windows But look, I mean, uh, how much does a PC cost, you know, these days? I mean, you could get one for a couple of hundred bucks, right? If a person can, I I think it's it's not a bad idea to have both platforms available. And regarding the iOS thing, I do think that Apple has really devoted a lot of resources to iOS. And there is talk of this whole thing about making iOS and macOS really not one thing, but, you know, iOS apps are going to be able to run on Macs and vice versa. I mean, it could be a great thing. It might cause all kinds of problems. I'm sure I'm sure it'll be both in a way. I know that there are certain things about voiceover, let's say, on, on the Mac OS that have been neglected. There are certain bugs that have been around now for like a whole operating system and, you know, aren't fixed. It is frustrating, but some people get 
very incensed about these things. To me, if there's nothing I can do about it, I I don't. Uh, I mean, I'll submit a bug report or whatever uh, and stuff like that. But beyond that, I I try not to get too upset about it. I think you have to think of these things a little bit more in a sort of a greater arc, a, a longer storyline and stuff like that. And I think that there are good things in store ultimately, but you know sometimes it does take uh, a much longer time. So I'm in it for the long run. When we hear about audio production efforts, usually if people are being interviewed who are expert commercial audio engineers, they will make reference if they start talking about how the sausage is made to Pro Tools. It's the industry standard. So in terms of what a blind person should choose. Reaper, for example, has really gained traction in the blind community. And one of the nice things about it is that blind people are kind of helping each other out. They've got Osara. They seem to have the ear of the Reaper developer, all that kind of stuff. And that seems to work okay for home studio type environments. In fact, I'm producing this podcast in Reaper. When should somebody stick with that and when should they go with a tool like Pro Tools which is that industry standard and kind of really the big daddy in the game well i certainly purchased reaper at a certain point so that i could you know learn what it's about and stuff like that i don't use it uh, for anything but once in a while i do sort of poke around in it just to see what might have changed etc to me i think it's great that it is an option that is very accessible an option that is not expensive. And yes, as is probably typical in various areas in the blind community, these smaller communities emerge and develop. Right now, there are a lot of WhatsApp groups devoted to, let's say, complete control, a native instruments, complete control environment, Reaper, uh, Logic, Pro Tools, even specific pieces of software, Melodyne or, uh, you know, Sibelius, another avid product for music notation. The thing with Pro Tools, yes, it is this quote unquote industry standard. I mean, it has been for a long time. I think that you can pretty much as a professional, not from a blindness perspective, but just as an audio professional cited, you could use just about any piece of software and get the results if you know how to use it. A wave file is a wave file. If it's at the right bit depth, uh, right sample rate, it's all the same in the end. Where Pro Tools has become this quote unquote industry standard is in the broadcast and studio industry. But As we know, I mean, the studio industry, I mean, it's been decimated. There are so many more smaller project studios and home studios these days that it doesn't matter whether you're using Pro Tools or anything else. Where Pro Tools, I think, comes into play a lot for people is when they're in school. And that's where this whole project really came from or is as a result of Berkeley College of Music in Boston. They have every year a crop of students, and very often there is a blind student among them. And the problem is, as quote-unquote accessible as Pro Tools is, you don't access it in the same way that a sighted person would. I mean, theoretically you do. I mean, if somebody tells you to click on a mute button... Well, you know, a sighted person sees that mute button, points the mouse at it, clicks, and that's it. They're done. Well, a blind user has to know, okay, well, which track? Uh, Okay, so I have to navigate to that track. Now I have to interact with it, and now I have to navigate down to that mute button and press it. Okay, and how do I? Well, it's the default action, just vo space. So there is this learning curve that it's not particularly steep, But so much of what goes on in the Pro Tools interface, especially in editing, is so highly visual in nature that the knowledge of just what button to click isn't enough. You have to understand what a selection entails. I mean, there are track selections, there are edit selections, there's selected as in a state of being on and off. The language kind of crosses over sometimes. And so no matter what, even though Pro Tools is, again, quote unquote, accessible, that the tools are 
visible. The use of it needs some training. Now, for the last 20 years or so, we've had a Google group, PT Access a Google group, where people ask questions and, and others share tips and tricks and you know best practices. A few years ago, we started this WhatsApp group, et cetera, et cetera. But there was always this need for a proper from soup to nuts or nose to tail, kind of like, how do you use Pro Tools as a blind user? And a lot of people sort of looked toward me as sort of like the logical choice. I am, I believe, the most experienced slash knowledgeable blind Pro Tools user. There are others who know quite a lot as well, you know, who also help out and stuff. But in terms of like really, you know, from beginning to end, I was the person that seemed like the logical choice. And the thing is, everybody knew that this was such a tremendously large project that it would have been impossible for me to justify the time investment. It was not something that I wanted to sell. I didn't want to start getting into producing something that would be for sale. And then you got to deal with, you know, it's a whole other can of worms. You know, I never wanted to do that. I wanted to make something for free. But how do you make it for free? You either do or you don't. And I just could not justify the time. Well, along came Berkeley College of Music. Now, one of their employees in the, uh, I forget what, what the, the lab is called, the Accessible Music Technology Lab, AMT Lab. Along comes Chi Kim, who's been at Berkeley for a long time. Chi is a blind musician and uh, a knowledgeable uh, programmer as well. And um, a couple of years ago, right when the pandemic hit, she approached me about doing a tutorial for Sibelius. Berkeley got a grant to help make Sibelius accessible, both on the Mac and Windows. They hired a full-time programmer and worked on accessibility. And, and at the end of it, I took the Getting Started Guide, which was, which was like a five-chapter thing, but the first three chapters were really enough to, to cover all of the major aspects of this program. And I did a tutorial based on the Avid Guide, and I did recorded examples, et cetera, et cetera. And we put this up for free because Berkeley wanted it to be available to everybody, not just their students. And they had some funding left over and asked me to do the same thing for Pro Tools, essentially. Now, for the Sibelius stuff, it was at the perfect time because the pandemic hit, the studio closed. I had no work, so I couldn't have asked for better timing. When the Pro Tools thing came up, I made some time, but I was still having sessions. And so, all told, I worked on it for about a year from beginning to end. And it was published just a couple of weeks ago. Just like Sibelius, it's available for free. And so now Berkeley can point its students toward this tutorial, which is uh, it's about 20 hours of audio and it's 20 some odd chapters of material specifically written. I mean, I wrote it from the ground up for blind users. It's based on a Pro Tools 101 and 110 course, which is like a certification course. There is no certification after the fact, but it's still based on those courses. So if you if you follow it, you really come away knowing Pro Tools pretty well. I mean, especially if you go through each and every chapter, each section, listen to the tutorials, try the things out. You know, uh, there are session files available with this whole online guide. And I think this is where people most often sort of get to a point where they have to learn Pro Tools because they're in school and they want to use Pro Tools because so many audio professionals use it. And it's just so easy to zip up a Pro Tools session folder and just send it and the person can open it on the other end and everything is in place. All the plugins are correct. I mean, you, basically you play the session and it sounds just like it did in the other studio, whether it's a professional, you know, commercial studio or whether it's a project studio. It's the kind of thing that when you need it and when you want to collaborate with others, having this tutorial is 
I think anybody in the blind community who has used Pro Tools without this guide would agree that it's a game changer to have this now because <laughs> this will also be a game changer for me because I can't tell you how many times on a daily basis I have to answer questions on a WhatsApp group or email list and I'm repeating myself. And now that this resource is available, my answer can now be, oh, Chachi FM. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's essentially what it is in a nutshell, yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to have a listen to this myself just because I'm curious about how things work. And Bonnie will be telling me, don't listen to this thing because she knows what might come next and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> there are some really interesting plugins and techniques and things. One of the most amazing pieces of audio production I've ever heard in my life, I realize it's a huge grand grandiose statement, and I don't know if you've heard mm. this, is the Beatles Love Album from 2006, where they kind of mashed oh, sure. up. I mean, that is a remarkable piece of engineering when you know the original tempo, the original pitch yes. that so many of these pieces were at, and the way they've been so beautifully melded together. That is one of the most extraordinary examples of what Pro Tool is capable of in the hands of good engineers. It truly is. And just audio technology in general, I mean, from a software standpoint, the stuff that Isotope is doing and stuff is just jaw dropping. I mean, yeah. what can be done and the sources that can be separated and treated differently and stuff. And, you know, we also saw some of that in the Get Back stuff. Oh, uh, the I mean, documentary. I've got those original yeah. tapes, you know, the digital versions, obviously, mm -hmm. of the original tapes. Yeah. And when I hear mm -hmm. what Peter Jackson did in terms of just restoring yes. those, it's remarkable. You, I would have had no idea that that was possible, what he managed to do there. Right. And some years ago, I was, I was at Abbey Road and and it was a, a, a day-long thing that we, that we did there. It was hosted by the guys who wrote um, – I'm drawing a blank. It's, it's like this gigantic book that is essentially 12 by 12, like a coffee table book. But, it, but the, the, the book itself looks like an EMI tape box. So it's like two inches thick. And it's basically like really an encyclopedia of like – Everything about the Beatles recording sessions, the mics they use, the tape machines, all of the processors, the outboard gear, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, it was the two authors that, that hosted this event. And while we were there, they played some stuff. This was in Studio 2. I don't even remember how many people were in attendance there. But they played some stuff that you know wasn't available to the public at the time. And I wonder if maybe it eventually made its way into the Get Back stuff. But they would play a bit of audio and you would hear you know, George fumbling on, you know, uh, uh, whatever, uh, twiddling on the guitar or whatever. And there was a, like a conversation or whatever. And then they would play it and the guitar was absolutely removed. I mean, like completely, yeah. you could, you could sense that it was still being played in the background, but now you could hear this conversation clearly. Whereas before there was no way you could make out what they were saying. So yeah, this kind of technology is just, it really is jaw-dropping. It's amazing what can be done. Again, Isotope as, as a company, a developer, just makes these tools that just, I, you know, I mean, I've used some of their restoration stuff and things like, you know, de-clicking, de-noising, de-hum, you know, all these things. And I mean, the first time I used like a de-clip processor for something that was distorted. I, I was given this master, it was a, from a CD, uh, you know, and the, the, the distortion is is baked in there. I, I said to the client, I said, I, I, I really don't think there's anything I can do. This is like, this is in the original recording. It's distorted, whatever. And, and I thought, well, let me, I, you know, let me look into it. And I gave it a try and I really, my jaw dropped when I heard the results. I mean, the distortion was gone. This was something that I was trained to, uh, you know, just, <laughs> I mean, there was nothing you could do. I accepted it as just, this is the way it is. There's nothing that can be done. And here it is like magic. I couldn't believe it. So yeah. Uh, yeah. And as time goes on, these things, you see it more and more every day, just these crazy things that can be done. I mean, I think back to the idea of separating time from pitch you know i mean with tape they went hand in hand you sped up something the pitch went up you slowed it down the pitch went down and the first time i remember witnessing or experiencing 
the idea that you could slow something down and not change the pitch, I mean, that was like revolutionary to me. And now it's like, oh, everybody can do that. That's like no big deal these days. And originally when that technology came along, there were horrible artifacts and now they really are yes. not in, in the right hands. Right. Uh, I've got the yeah. Isotope RX suite, the professional suite, which does interface yeah. with Reaper. And mm -hmm. it is amazing. I mean, be, being able to take a lot of noise, uh, sort of e even just basic things that I need, like taking fan noise when you're interviewing somebody on location and there's air conditioning running hot or something like that. And right. you can clean it up. You can take out reverb, all kinds of stuff like that. It's interesting that you talk about taking tracks apart. Bonnie and I and uh, my youngest daughter are going to London in September to do the ABBA Voyage show. And then we're going to Stockholm to see the ABBA Museum. So I'm on a bit of an ABBA kick mm -hmm. at the moment. And uh, I took just the original FLAC file of the winner takes it all and oh, decom de like basically disassembled yeah. it so that we have Agneta's yeah. vocal. That vocal, uh -huh. I mean, it's amazing anyway, but when she's just singing on her own, essentially a cappella, all the instruments gone, God, it is yes. one of the most heart-wrenching things. It's so raw and yes. real. Yes, it's absolutely fascinating to, to do stuff like that. I mean, and I remember back in the day, you know, it was uh, it was great to be able to find like a multi-track session, you know, so yeah. there were a you couple the of famous ones <laughs> that went around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. So I remember, you know, I, I even did one of the podcast episodes on superstition, you know, because the Stevie Wonder multi-track went around and I like kind of took it apart and stuff like that. And there were quite a number of such multi-track sessions well nowadays you can pretty much take it apart yourself with software and it's just it's incredible uh yeah. it's so much fun and you could really <laughs> get lost uh, you know get into the weeds uh, with with this kind of stuff but i find it endlessly fascinating the whole Sgt. Pepper album has been available for some time in Stems, and mm -hmm. uh, when they were announcing that it was going to be redone in 2017, I thought, oh, well, I'll just put it into Reaper and have a go at this, and of course came up with nothing close to what they were able to do. But, you know, it, it, it's a lot of fun, as you say, to just play with, and it kind of helps you understand how sound molds together, how things are made, and it's just a fun thing to do. Does it bother you, just as a bit of a non sequitur, that you probably hopefully take some time out, you're listening to good quality movies and that kind of thing. A lot of audio described content forces blind people into stereo, even though a movie's been produced in 5.1 or Atmos. You switch the audio description on and quite often you only get stereo. In fact, Get Back was exactly like this. So the choice I had was to listen to Get Back first and listen to it in stereo with audio description oh. so I understood what was going on. Then I yeah. turned the audio description off and went back to the main track and got the Atmos. Yeah. You know, I'm not big on Atmos. My control room is set up for 5.1. But there are so few projects these days that require it that I really have not used anything 5.1 for a while. Now, one could argue, well, now is the perfect time to get into Atmos. <laughs> Maybe so, but I have yet to have one request from any of my clients for anything Atmos. So I don't consume anything in an Atmos environment, but I could completely understand the issue here. I mean, as it is, we're already at the mercy of being subjected to so often. Well, I'm not even going to talk about the quality of the description because that's something that just makes my eyes roll so far back into my head. I'm, I'm looking at my own butt. Right. I, you know, there is the issue of the description being so much louder than the content or vice versa, yes, that like, yes. I, you know, and that already kind of drives me crazy, but it's just something that I just learned to say, yeah, it is what it is and what can I do? But, you know, I can't foresee how description is going to be incorporated into Atmos programming unless it is encoded a different way. Apple's I, doing I, it. I, Apple does it. Oh, if, if you watch all the stuff on Apple TV+, Plus, you are getting Atmos, mm -hmm. and the audio description's coming out of the center channel. So it's it's coming out of the, the, the central speaker where a lot of vocals oh, come okay. up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so it's right. possible. Okay, so I, 
Uh, yes. I'm, oh, I'm sure it is. And, and if anybody is going to do it, I mean, I could see Apple doing it yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, on a sort of like Netflix and other kind of platform level, I don't know. Putting the description in the center channel makes probably perfect sense. Although, given that that is where a lot of dialogue is centered, I mean, quite literally, I'm sure that some people would argue, why not have the option of choosing which channel you want the description coming out? You know, maybe you want it out of the left rear speaker because that's where the blind person is, is right. seated on the couch right. and his wife is on the other side and she doesn't really need to hear that. Well, know. this is the I, thing because when you have teenagers, suddenly having a, a blind parent might not be cool for a little bit. Hopefully they come out the other side okay and they might resent the audio description. It, it's always interested me that with all of the work that Apple has done on syncing and Sonos for that matter, wouldn't it be great mm -hmm. if you could elect as, as just one option to have the yes. audio description come to, to your iPhone? The, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Root the audio to to a, an AirPod or yeah. something. Yeah, I mean these things. I'm sure are much easier said than done. But it's technology, so all it takes is for somebody to say. Well, let's do it this way and let's make this the protocol, you know, and I'm sure it's not just as easy as that, but it's got to start somewhere and some standards have to be in place. I mean, there's already the standard that they came up with that, you know, was basically the secondary audio programming, you know, and stuff. And mm. that already exists. It didn't always exist. I mean, description used to come to us on a videotape. I mean, you had to get it from descriptive video services in Boston, you know, and that was it. It was just a, a video cassette and it had the, des the description and you couldn't turn it off. That's what it is, what it is, or it was what it was. And then, you know, when it became part of broadcast television, well, that was incredible and it was great because you could turn it on or off and stuff and now that things are so digital in nature they're no longer sort of broadcast over the in in the ether if you will i think anything is possible look atmos is a standard that didn't exist some years ago and now it's here and i think it's a matter of perhaps a little time but maybe description can be applied to the given environment It'll probably take some time. And I know that Amazon and Netflix and, and Apple, they have their description that is produced and stuff, but I don't know who's doing it. I mean, like, obviously there are companies like, usually it's a captioning company that's paired up with a descriptive uh, audio description service. I don't know to what extent they are really listening to the blind community or getting input from blind users. I, I know of one particular descriptive video service that does use blind describers and blind audio professionals, but that's just one company. I, I, I really don't think that uh, others are doing that. And so it makes you wonder, well, are they really hearing some of the requests? I, I, I don't yeah. know. When I would travel to the US conventions when the kids were little, I would stock up on those VHS cassettes that you talk about and bring them home with the <laughs> yeah. audio description. And it's funny because yeah. some movies like The Incredibles and others from that period, now when the kids see them as adults, they feel like something's lacking because the audio description was just how they always consumed those movies. Isn't that interesting? And they feel oh. like it's missing. <laughs> so that is interesting. Yeah. You mentioned that Isotope is. before, and it made me think to pick your brain a bit, particularly in terms of VST plugins, because that's a kind of an open standard, and no matter what tool people are using, chances are they can make a VST plugin work. Are there any particular plugins that you recommend people look at in terms of compressors? and uh, channel strips, anything like that that you really like? Well, being a Pro Tools user, I mean, the platform that Pro Tools uses is AAX. So Pro Tools doesn't use VST. And just like Logic uses audio units, the AU format, also Logic doesn't support VST. But pretty much any plugin that you get these days, mostly, eh, kind of like 99% of the time, it's going to be AU, VST, AAX. It's going to be all three platforms. So as far as plugins these days, I have to say there are so many out there that it's almost impossible to single out anything. But I would say that there are a few plugin packages that I particularly like. 
And the first one that really comes to mind is Plugin Alliance. Mm. Plugin Alliance, they sell individual plugins and they have a tremendous number. I think there's 150 different plugins or something like that. But they do offer a subscription. I don't understand the business model exactly, but to get all of their plugins is $250 per year and you get a voucher for $250 that you can apply toward the purchase of any of their plugins. To me, it's a no-brainer as a business owner. To me, I want to use their products. They have amazing plugins. A lot of the plugins that are used, um, that, that are uh, part of the Plugin Alliance subscription bundle, then they have smaller bundles too. I mean, they have things that are aimed at guitar amps and stuff. But I, I just choose the sort of the whatever their all plug-in bundle, complete plug-in bundle, whatever they call it. A lot of their plugins are designed by the same company that does all the stuff for Universal Audio or most of the stuff for Universal Audio, which is BX. Uh, and so like... Uh, all of their plugins are just so wonderful. They're all accessible. Sometimes you might have to use like some presets as a starting point, but all kinds of presets floating around there. A lot of blind communities like the WhatsApp groups, you know, they have drop boxes that are shared. And so people share presets and that sort of thing. And the other one that I would probably mention, uh, well, two things. One is uh, Eventide. They make Really wonderful, wonderful plugins, just amazing sounding plugins. And the last one would be Sound Toys that also have a, a suite of plugins. They're not subscription based, but I think their plugin package, which features, I don't know, 60 or so plugins, is, you know, in the neighborhood of, I don't know, two or $300. And you just get so many wonderful, wonderful plugins, especially if you're into the idea of sort of mangling audio and like, you know, again, from a music standpoint, just apply these plugins that'll give you sort of crazy results. And the same is true of Eventide. They're just so much fun. You did a new album recently, right? Can you tell me about that? I did. And, and it was something that I didn't mean to wait 20 years yeah. <laughs> from the release of the first one back in 2002. But yeah, I mean, it was something that I worked on a little bit here and there, you know, as a songwriter and then would put down and it was putting out an album or rec making recordings as an artist. It doesn't pay my bills or anything like that. So it, it never is a priority for me at a certain point some years ago i said well I, you know i've got to finally just get this stuff out and and i i did a big push uh, got the drums recorded with with a dear friend of mine who played on my first album and i've recorded many of his albums all of his albums then again something happened and the ball dropped and then you know well finally it wasn't because of the pandemic, but it, it just so happened that after I did that Sibelius project, I had gotten to the point where I had all of the music, everything that I had that was necessary for the album, I had it all done. I just still hadn't done my vocals. And so I just took the time. I didn't have any other sessions. And I just did the vocals. I did the mixing and finally decided to put it out. It's called uh, Years Have Gone By. Anniversary approaching fast Years have gone by Years have gone by Years have gone by But not a day has passed And it's available on all of the various platforms and stuff like that. It's funny. I grew up buying albums. You know, I would buy LPs. I would buy CDs and stuff like that. And these days, that's just no longer the case. I mean, few people actually purchase because they pay a monthly subscription for streaming. And so I, I totally get that. I mean, believe me, uh, you know, there are certain artists that no matter what, I will buy their albums, their records, well, records <laughs> in quotes, <laughs> you know, I will buy their albums no matter what, just because I'm such a big fan. 
But there are plenty of artists that, you know, if, if I want to hear their latest album, I'll have Siri play it for me. I'll play it in Apple Music or whatever. And um, sometimes I do end up buying the album afterwards. But sometimes it's just a matter of like, oh, OK, I, I get it. And that's enough. I don't need to spend 10 bucks or whatever it is on this. But um, I'm happy that I put it out and I've gotten wonderful feedback and stuff like that. And, and it's wonderful when months later someone will you know, out of the blue just you know drop a line or call and say like oh my gosh i was driving from somewhere etc cetera, etc cetera, and i put on your album and oh yeah. my gosh it's so great and they, they just really appreciate it and so that it's it's wonderful to get that kind of feedback it is an epic album it's an outstanding oh, album. oh thank you but gee i remember as a spotty youth you know spotty youth <laughs> making all those really difficult decisions about what album will I buy with the pocket money I have, you know, and now for the price yeah. of that one album that I had to agonize over, you can subscribe and get 25, 30, whatever it is, million songs. It's sure. Great, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a diff. It's, it's such a different world. And uh, uh, I'm an old fart, but uh, I mean, you know, the way c kids consume music today is it's just so different than what we're used to. And that's fine. It, it is what it is. I, I, I mean, it's interesting. My wife and I uh, took this uh, young woman out to dinner a couple of weeks ago. We met her at a benefit concert. She's from Ukraine. Her husband is fighting and she decided to leave and she's in New York right now. Uh, she's been here since February and stuff like that. And so we took her out uh, after this particular, not and not the same day after this event, but that's where we met her. But then a couple of weeks later, she got in touch and we took her out for dinner and stuff like that. And we were talking about music and stuff. And I'm so such a terrible judge of age, but I know that she's certainly older than 20, but she could be 30. I don't know. But she's a, she's a young woman. And she <laughs> shared a bunch of links in an email afterwards because we were talking about you know various bands that my wife and I had never heard of and stuff like that. And it's just so funny because like... I mean, these are people that just I would have never uh, I, I just would never hear of these acts, you know, and then, yeah. you know, you, you look into it a little bit and then you'll see an interview with, uh, you know, with this person in The New York Times from somewhere, you know, some year, a year ago or two years ago or whatever. And, uh, you know, there's just only so much bandwidth that one has as they get older. And if you want to seek out stuff, you know, you, you can find it. You know, I think a younger generation is sort of paying more attention to what their peers are listening to. I couldn't give a crap about what my peers are listening to. <laughs> Don't you think you it's interesting, I mean? though, that it's clear that there is some music that is just utterly timeless from the era where you and I were growing up. Um, yes. I really thought that when my kids were growing up, I would be immunized from what happened to my parents, which is that they basically just got turned off from the music that I was listening to. They just, they just didn't really mm -hmm. mind or care, you know. And I thought, yeah. well, I'm going to keep current and be a cool dad and listen to what my kids are listening to so I can bond with them over the musical trends, you know. But what actually yeah. happened was my oldest daughter's into Billy Joel and Abba. My oldest son right. is into Bowie and Queen. And uh, they're, yes. all, they're all into the Beatles. You know, we got rock band when they were young. And we're all jamming along on rock sure. band, Yellow Submarines, part of their DNA. <laughs> uh, they watch that animated movie all the time. Now, my youngest daughter is into Taylor Swift, who I actually think is a very gifted lyricist and composer. Yes. And, you know, she writes bubblegum stuff, but that's what sells. But she is really very talented. But you know, other Absolutely. than that, I haven't had much exposure. And so um, my oldest son is now starting to get into a bit of music. He's an audio engineer, actually. He he trained as wow. an audio engineer and uh, did broadcasting school and stuff. And uh, wow. so he's been exposed to a bit of new music. He set up a Spotify playlist for me called Music for Dad. <laughs> and, and it's got new music in it, so maybe there's That's hope for great. me. But it's interesting that this music, some of that classic stuff from the 60s and 70s, and uh, not yes. so much the 80s, the 80s are a bit more disposable, but that some of the 60s right. and 70s stuff is still very much alive in the culture of younger yes. people. Yes, absolutely. And music from before that will always certainly be around, and there will always be an audience that appreciates traditional jazz and bebop and even swing and, you know, going back. But those are decidedly smaller audiences. 
but there was something about what happened in the 60s and 70s that was sort of a big bang that changed the trajectory of music. And so things like Motown and 70s funk and not prog rock so much, not prog rock bands, but but bands like glam rock, you know, things like, like you say, Bowie and Queen. Mm. They had such a tremendous effect. And I mean, the Beatles, my goodness, it really is a phenomenon that... I just can't imagine happening again, but I'm sure it will at some point. But there's just something about it that it's it's really interesting and it's kind of inexplicable. Yeah, but it's a bizarre freak of nature that it. those four people happens to get it together is. Yes. with that kind of yes. chemistry. And I mean, when yes. you just hear what happened between Love Me Do and the Abbey Road album, it was only yeah. seven short years, you know? You yes. Know? Yes, yes, yes. It, it's it's really, it's kind of miraculous. I mean, it's just, to me, it's just inexplicable. But yet it happened. And I mean, we're just so fortunate to have been around after that. <laughs> you know, I, during and after. I mean, uh, I was just a kid when the Beatles were, were together. But, you know, the echoes of their achievements, I mean, they're still strong today. I mean, they are just such giants, whether they're acknowledged or not as such. I mean, they have had an influence and other people influence them, certainly, undoubtedly. But it's just this kind of perfect storm of things that came together and happened that just extraordinary yeah yeah the, the, so i don't the, know what it is the abbey yeah. road dolby atmos mix is worth a listen by the way um mm-hmm. it's, yeah it's really yeah really. now vinyl sounds better than digital is what you it often hear these days not. is 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 that a bunch <laughs> of malarkey look from a technical standpoint vinyl absolutely does not sound better than you know digital recording i mean better what with surface noise and pops and yeah, cracks exactly and dust i mean come all, on you know <laughs> no no no, yeah, absolutely. There's this fallacy, and 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 I understand why people f- fall for this completely misguided thinking. They think that digital recording has steps, so that it's like it's not smooth, it's not analog, and they they don't understand how electronics work. They don't understand what a plot is and how it works, and, and so you you have these. People that think that digital is not like analog, and so therefore it can't be as good. It's just wrong. It's just plain wrong. Yeah. Um, so I've been no trying to. I like what, to. I like to understand yeah. why people think the way they do because it's a bunch of bull soup, right? I mean, it is. And one of the explanations I got, which is the most credible explanation I've heard, is that what happens when you've played vinyl enough is that you get a kind of a corruption or a wearing of the grooves to an extent that that can raise the high frequencies a little bit. And what people are actually responding to, if they really do think that vinyl sounds better, is slightly more treble. And so they think vinyl is clearer or richer or something like that. But I think, mm. you know, I was talking to my son about this. I've got shelf upon shelf of vinyl records and we were going through them a few years ago and when richard found my original pressing of uh, meat loves bad out of hell it was like <laughs> I, yeah. I, it was like he he let out this kind of yahoo and a whoop that i've never heard him make before or since because right. you know he had this original <laughs> vinyl pressing of bad out of hell and it's got a bit of crackle sure. by now because bad out of hell sure. is a well played album by the way it needs re of Not course. just remastering, but remixing. It's a it's a really poor yeah. recording. And I said to him, yeah, what is it about the vinyl? Now, he's an audio engineer now. He's all grown up. And he does admit to me, it's really about the experience. It's about the experience of putting on a record yeah. and sitting down and letting it play. And I totally get that. But it doesn't sound sure, better. Of course. No, no, it absolutely doesn't. And vinyl has so many physical limitations i mean there are so many aspects of it that are just compromised it does not and it cannot sound as good as digital that's just a fact but i'm not saying that a person couldn't possibly enjoy 
a vinyl record, mm. <laughs> you know, as much. They can enjoy it more because as, as your son mentioned and as we know, it's about the ritual of listening. Yes. You were an active participant, you know, from the time that you thumbed through the LPs and you pulled out gingerly the LP, took it out of its sleeve and carefully placed it. It really was a ritual. And me, I remember as a kid reading the liner notes, every word of it and like recognizing names from one album and saying like, oh, that's the same guy who did this or played this or was the engineer on this or produced this, whatever. I mean, it was a rich experience and it was like 18 minutes or 20 minutes maybe. Then you had to decide, oh, am I going to, I'm going to listen to the other side, Uh, you know, sure or not or whatever. It was a whole world. It was a whole experience. And that is just gone. I mean, just nobody listens to music that way anymore. Um, well, apparently they do, is, though, because vinyl's coming back. I mean. Well, <laughs> yeah, yes, it, it is true. And I think that's part of the romance of it. And there are certainly record clubs, uh, you know, small independent labels that issue vinyl releases of the artists that they sign and people love it i mean the the people who love vinyl love vinyl um there's no reasoning with them i tell you well again they love the experience it's not the sound i mean as much as they might think it is or they claim it is no it is absolutely not about the sound it isn't it's about the experience and it's about the not i was gonna say genre then i was gonna say oeuvre it's really just about the whole world that listening to vinyl entails, you know, and it's it is the experience. It's not the sound. I mean, look, cassettes have made a resurgence as well. Cassettes. Yes. <laughs> who, who, Richard's into those who as well. Argues, <laughs> right. And who would argue that they sound good? They don't. They sound like crap. And there are even plugins that emulate cassettes. Yeah. I mean, it's to the point where it's uh, absurd, but it, it is this, you know, again, I think LPs like vinyl, you know, it's nostalgia. Why not listen to 78s? You know, well, I mean, yeah. I've, I've, yeah. yeah. So I, you know, yeah. you're right about the experience. <laughs> uh, the, the, the album artwork as well. I remember hearing the story of how the Beatles came to produce that iconic Sgt. Pepper cover. And they said when they were going home from the NEMS music store where Brian Epstein was the manager and they just bought Mm -hmm. their album that they could afford to buy or they could do on the bus until they got it home to put it on the turntable was look at it. And so they wanted artwork that would keep people occupied. And boy, that album kept people occupied. One of the things that my son Richard did, and sadly he discontinued it, was he did a podcast called cover act and it would just be a 15 or 20 minute episode in which he would go into great detail describing and commenting on the artwork of iconic albums and i said to him you may not realize what you've done here but actually you've created a great podcast for the blind community because many of us missed out on that and he said yeah i really hadn't thought about that but that's right and it was amazing listening to some of his very detailed descriptions and commentary on some iconic album covers so wow, a, yeah, that's fascinating. And and you know, the album covers it really was a big part of the album. I mean, it was the visual representation. I mean, now you know everybody has an avatar or an icon, you know, some, some kind of graphic element, you know, that's associated with their brand or whatever. And there is cover art, of course, for like an iTunes song or whatever. But it's just not the same. You're not. It's not twelve by twelve. You know, you're not looking at it in a large format. There's often probably little attention paid to some of the cover art, but there were back in the day, I remember a a book that was published. It was just a photo book of all of the Blue Note record covers. I mean, it it wasn't about the music at all. I mean, of course, you have all these famous artists whose album covers are in these books, but it wasn't about the music. It was about the art that was involved, you know, the photography of these album covers and the album design. It was a big part of music, the music industry back in the day. These days, not so much. But of course, you know, there are other things that have replaced it. You know, now you have, uh, well, videos, you know, you have YouTube videos, you have all kinds of other things that are visually rich in nature. 
but there's something about a still photograph that almost says more it being a still rather than a video clip. You know, there's something, I don't know, enigmatic about it. Just before we wrap, because I'm amazed how long we've been talking, this has been so much fun, I did want to comment on the fact that you very kindly closed in a spectacular way the We're With You benefit concert for Ukraine with the contribution that you submitted. And you've mentioned during this interview your Ukrainian descent. This must be a very difficult time for Ukrainian communities everywhere. How are you responding to that? Well, yeah, it's it's been very difficult. Uh, I mean, uh, gosh, I mean, y- y- you take it a day at a time. I-, I mean, when the war started, of course, uh, it was extremely difficult, of course. Uh, b- but I wouldn't be out of line to say that, look, a lot of people had no idea what was going to happen. And... Of course, there are probably those, (laughs) Putin himself and those around him, that certainly thought that Ukraine was going to just fold in a matter of 48 hours, a couple of days, whatever. And fortunately, they resisted, which, you know, now in retrospect, I can't say that I expected anything. I didn't I didn't expect a war. You know, so it's like if you asked me back then, I I would have had no idea, uh, you know, what would happen. The fact that Ukraine has resisted and fought back is extraordinary. It's horrible in terms of the loss of life and stuff like that and lives uprooted. I'm afraid that as the war goes on and who knows what's going to happen, who knows how long it's going to last. There certainly will be public fatigue over it, and just people will stop paying attention to it. You already see it dropping down the news cycle, don't you? Oh, sure, but there are so many other things happening. So so that's natural, Mm. I I think. So I I don't blame the media or anything like that. it's just the nature of news, I think, isn't it? It's just the – yeah, it's just the nature of it and stuff. I think in Europe, it's certainly much more of a story because it's – right there in their backyard. I have family in Ukraine, although they're further in the western part. I do have a large number of colleagues in Kyiv and further east, but mostly in Kyiv, that I've worked with for a couple of decades. And throughout all of this, I I think to myself, my goodness, like at any moment, there could be a hydrogen bomb or a nuclear bomb, you know, on cave and and i mean i i certainly hope that doesn't happen but i would not put it past putin you know so i i i don't know what to think and i and i try not to think about these things and i and i and i uh i follow the news and other outlets i mean obviously the media at large isn't isn't covering it so much but i stay in touch with people in ukraine i watch ukrainian news sources i mean a newspaper print and stuff like that uh, which is you know stuff that's available online and i'm just standing by to see what happens i have been taking part in fundraising concerts uh in fact my ex-wife and i we put out several ukrainian language albums back in the 80s and 90s. And we performed in Ukraine uh, a few times on on television and in the first official Ukrainian popular music festival back in 1989. And we won the favorite international band award or, you know, I can't remember what the, it's hard to translate what what that actual quote unquote award was, but we were laureates of of this festival. And we performed in the Eastern part uh, two years later at at the same festival, but it was kind of, it became a tradition, you know, like every other year they would have this same festival now, you know, like a Lollapalooza, if you will, or whatever, but it would travel through different cities in Ukraine. And we put out our last recording in the late 90s. And we split up around that time and stuff. And uh, we've decided to get together and do like sort of a a reunite for a benefit that'll take place in the tri-state area in September. And this whole fatigue thing concerns me a little bit. But the thing is, the Ukrainian community here will not get fatigued. I mean, 
whatever it takes to raise funds to, you know, for humanitarian efforts, sending food, supply, medicine. I mean, it's just something that the community will continue to do. And so uh, we decided that uh, we'll contribute doing what we do as a team, doing what we do best or what we did best and just do it, do it again. And uh, hey, maybe we'll do it in Ukraine <laughs> as well yeah. when when this is over, hopefully. And um, I'll tell you what, Jonathan, nobody knows what the future holds. But what I know and what what others have said as well, Putin is not forever. You know, he'll be gone and Ukraine will outlive him. So I think it's a matter of enduring this fighting doing what we can to resist and fight back. And I think that uh, ultimately Ukraine will emerge victorious. It's a tragedy, but I think ultimately it will have a positive result, all things told. It's wonderful that the two of you are going to be doing that. I have enjoyed this time so much, and I really appreciate you giving me so much of it. The critical thing, if people would like to grab these Pro Tools tutorials and learn more about it, where do people go to do that? They would go to PT Access, so P-T-A-C-C-E-S-S dot GitHub, so it's G-I-T-H-U-B dot I-O. That's easy enough. We will put a link to that in the show notes. So ptaccess.github.io. And I'll grab it myself mm -hmm. and take a listen. Thank you so much for all you do. You're a legend. Thank you, and Jonathan. it's really great to be talking with you. I appreciate it. Very kind words. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And I appreciate you giving me the time to, to share this information with your listeners. Thank you so much. I love to hear from you, so if you have any comments you want to contribute to the show, drop me an email written down or with an audio attachment to Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N at mushroomfm.com. If you'd rather call in, use the listener line number in the United States, 864-606-6736. Who's in it for?